the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA09. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. And hey, we're back. It is Wednesday. Happy Woo! Wednesday, everyone. I hope you all are having a great week so far. It is almost a weekend, sort of. Uh, we are back and we are doing another episode of Doom to Fail. This time we're going to go into the true crime section of this, which is also kind of historic this time, because if you remember from Monday, my timeline of my story and the timeline of Taylor's story of Krakatoa erupting are pretty much completely in sync with one another. So here we are. Uh, Taylor. I still don't believe you. and I can't wait to hear exactly what it says. Know, what, this how is could a, it possibly have happened on the same day? This is a long con. Uh, Let's see. Okay, so I'm still drinking my big old glass of milk because we're going to be covering, in a, not a great way, babies. And milk is a critical part of their development. <laughs> <laughs> or, so, or so I'm told. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll dive right in. So first off, I want to say that this story came from a friend and listener, Daniel Shepard. Dan, thank you for making this suggestion. Um, he shot me a text last week and said, hey, you should look into this thing. I, I just stumbled on it and it's pretty crazy. And I was like, yep, that is absolutely crazy. So I'm gonna start <laughs> by discussing this cultural curiosity and the crime that it ultimately ended up spurring that we're gonna be going deeper into. The cultural curiosity is a thing called baby farming. Do you know what that is, Taylor? Okay. I, I don't know, having a bunch of babies and selling them to people? I mean, the spirit of what you're saying is accurate. It's all horrible, maladjusted behavior, but yes, uh, sort of like that. What baby farming really is, is basically a completely unsanctioned, unregulated version of like foster care for children. So basically if you were a rich family and your 16 year old daughter got pregnant, you would put an ad in the paper saying, we got to get rid of this thing here's 10 bucks to take it. And then it would just go somewhere else. And that's where it would be. There's two versions of this. And I'll bring up the first version, the the more common version of it first, which is basically paying a weekly stipend to another person to just care for your baby. So every, every week you give them like five pence and they care for your baby. And then whenever you decide that you want your baby back, you can go back and it's like a pawn shop for babies. It's like pawning your child. Like, yeah, like a super intense daycare. <laughs> it's an interest-free loan on a infant. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> and, but there's another version of this that is actually way worse. And it'll be obvious why it's way worse as I get into the story. The other version of it is you pay a lump sum and the kid just goes away. So in that version, you just say, hey, I don't want this thing at all anymore here's like a couple bucks take this baby and typically Mm -hmm. a baby farm would just take it and that'd be the kind of the end of it obviously the unintended consequence of a lump sum payment on a human being is that the money runs out before the kid is big enough to support itself and so what do you do when that happens what do you what what, yeah what, what happens when you know you gave me 50 bucks to take care of your baby for 18 years and it's the second month and I'm out of the $50. I sold it to someone else. If right? you, so if you were a very moral upstanding citizen, yes, you would transact that baby to another person that wanted to acquire a baby. But if you're a little bit okay. more you kill the baby? you kill the baby. Oh no. Yeah. So the good news, the good news for us, Taylor, is that despite America's history with transacting humans, this really didn't take on in the US the way it did in Australia and the UK. It was a bigger thing Mm -hmm. there than ever was here. It was still a thing here, but not as big as it was there. But I will stress the caveat that these were not real businesses. So there was no like, these weren't like S corps being filed. Yeah, th- these are not like Delaware corporations that are being created in 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 on the with the, the Nasdaq happening. I don't know what, what any of this is, but like <laughs> these these are just like these are just <laughs> business, people, business, business, business <laughs> filing cabinet <laughs> official. Uh, these are just private Charts. homes that people <laughs> are 
bringing unwanted children into. And so we don't know how prevalent it was, but we know that it was super prevalent in Australia in the UK. So okay. that's the cultural curiosity part of what we're going to talk about. The actual story of the main antagonists of who we're going to talk about are two Aussies in New South Wales, which is where Sydney is. And their names are John Sidney Macon and his wife, Sarah mm-hmm. Jane Sutcliffe. Okay. And you know what? I sort of told a half truth about our dates. Okay. Because these people get sentenced and brought to justice in 1883. They got married on August 27th, my birthday, 1871. So, like, it's pretty damn close. It's close, no, right? No, I think that's pretty close. And they okay. definitely felt Kr- Krakatoa. There you go. Officially, you know, they definitely heard it. 100%. So John and Sarah, they're in New South Wales, and they ended up having 10 kids of their own. So five boys, five girls. I don't know what it is in human DNA where, like, the least able to take care of children are the ones who have, like, fucking all of them. But, like, these were definitely in that category of, like, they should have probably stopped at one or two and not carried on with 10 more children because John was basically a giant fuck up. Like, he couldn't hold down a job. Mm-hmm. Like, he was just... Obviously, this is the 1800s. Women didn't work. And so, like, he was just, like, this dipshit. He would just work somewhere for a month, get fired, and then lounge around the house and get fired the next week. Mm-hmm. He did not have the facilities to care for a, a 12-person family, basically. Right. On or about 1881, John suffered an injury that basically prevented him from working completely, even these stupid odd jobs that he would have. And according to neighbors, he basically just lounged around the house. He hung out on the front porch. He was just he was useless. Like he was a useless human. Mm-hmm. He was. You know what's funny is like, if you're gonna be like that kind of useless, at least be fun. At least be like a drug addict. At least be a drunk. Like, have a good reason for why you're that useless. Like, you can't just fucking like not have any substance use problems. And you just like sit at home and just like chill. Do you agree? <laughs> like, there's no good reason. I I mean, I don't know if I agree, 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 but like, that's like be fun. But like, yeah. I mean, who knows? I mean, he wasn't even doing anything cool with it. He wasn't just like, he wasn't like sitting at home. Like He wasn't like going to the pool hall and like hanging out with his boys. Like he was just sitting at home. Like, yeah. Whatever. That's right. We were at our neighbor's house today and she's retired. And Florence was like, she's retired. I was like, yep, she doesn't have a job. And Florence goes, does that mean she's free? And I was like, it does. And she goes, I can't wait for you to be free. And I was like, I know, girl, I know. me too. Florence, we all. <laughs> None of us can wait to retire. <laughs> we all feel this way. Universally. <laughs> so. The so basically, John can't work at this time, and because there's no supervision or regulation on any of this stuff, him and his wife Sarah decided they want to be baby farming, baby farmers. Oh, it's so weird. And the way yes. this would, the way this typically would work in Australia was that a mother would put an advertisement in the paper, and saying, "Hey, I got a baby I don't want." Whoever wants it, this one's yours, and I'll give you a couple bucks to take it off my hands. And so this is the lump. Should be the opposite. What do you mean? I just feel like, like I feel like people should pay you to take your baby. Like that's what happens now. Like it costs a lot of money to get a baby. Like if you're adopting one, you have to go through a bunch of stuff. Like the person giving away the baby doesn't pay to have their baby adopted. People pay to adopt the baby. That that's oversimplifying it, but like it feels like people who want babies. I mean, the or is incentive, it just money? But then you have a baby. You have to take care of a baby. The incentive structure here's, here really seem mostly aligned me. with getting rid of unwanted children, not supplying willing families with children. But where do they think that they're going? Okay, I know you're going to answer these questions. I just, <laughs> that's very confusing to me. Continue. I mean, a lot of good came out of this case, actually, at the end of it, because, like, this type of business completely became illegal as a result of this case. Good, because it doesn't make any sense. So great. I'm glad. I feel like, it's okay, that makes me feel better. But, you, like I mentioned before, the latter version of the payment model is what we discussed earlier. That's what this is. It's, I'm going to put an advertisement in the paper. Come take this kid off my hands. There's five bucks in it for you if you do. And that's kind of okay. the slump sum model, right? And so, for this story... We're going to kind of begin at the ending. Actually, before we do that, Taylor, let me do some real quick math. Let me let me do some some Australian math. Um, how much okay. is what does that mean? Up, upside down math. A British pound worth in eighteen eighty. Wow, that is not a lot of money. 
Okay. All right, we well, can keep going. <laughs> Are you going to tell me or just like, no? Because because this is, um, oh my God, that's so not enough money for a baby. <laughs> so, okay. So, no, 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 wait, that's not right. Is that right? Wait, value of a, of 1880 British pound today. Hold on. Uh, a value, okay, a hundred pounds in 1880 is worth fifteen thousand three hundred ninety dollars. So one pound is worth fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. So that means Taylor. That means okay. So. Generally, the payment you would get for taking this baby off someone's hands was about three pounds. It varied. It was between two and five pounds, but the the story I'm talking about, it was about three pounds. That's $4,500 to take care of a baby for the rest of its life. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. I'm trying to think, like, it's so, it's, this is not here or there, but it's so interesting to me how you can break down a pound to like a half penny, like a quarter penny, because you'd like have to. If like a pound is like worth fifteen hundred dollars, like no, how pences. much is a piece of bread? Yeah, it was pence. Like one was, pence is like a tenth of a penny. It yeah, has to be like really, 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 really small. Yeah, it's gonna be super, super small. Like how low? No. Um. So again, we're gonna start at the end of the story here. So the the end of the story, we're gonna fast forward. So we're, we're at like the, we're at 1881. That's when the farming business began. The farming business. I'm acting like they're like professionals here. And we're gonna go to 1892 instead. So on October 11th of 1892, two contractors were digging a trench behind a home on what's called Burren Street. I'm gonna refer to the streets here because there's multiple homes that all this shit happened in and the streets are the only way to keep them straight in my head. So Okay. We're on Burn Street. This is all in Sydney. We're in Burn Street. Can you spell that word? What, what word are you saying? B U R R E N. Burn. Okay, got it. And these two contractors, they're digging a ditch. They're trying to connect the sewage pipe from the house to the sewage pipe to the city, the city line. And they come across a badly decomposed body of something. They assume it's a cat. They don't know what it is. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. whatever. This is a normal day in Sydney, I guess. And they just keep digging. They go a little further. And that's when they find what is very obvious and clearly the dead body of a female infant. And mm-hmm. seeing this, they're like, let's go back to the original. Let's go to the dead cat and see what that was all about. And they're like, oh, that's also a baby. And so they obviously call the police and they run these bodies down to the coroner's office. A medical examination is done. And they start questioning the residents of this house. And they discovered that the residents of that house had only moved in three weeks ago. The coroner determined that the badly decomposed body had been there for three months. And the other one had been there for six weeks, roughly. So no matter what, it could not have been the current residents that had done this. The police inquired as to who the previous residents were and the Macon's name came up. They had since mm-hmm. moved to a house on Wells Street, which is like a mile away from the Burn Street house, basically. So Burn Street is where the original two bodies were found. Wells Street is where they had moved mm-hmm. to after Burn Street. So three mm-hmm. days later, and about a mile away from the Burn Street house, police find the body of another male infant. And what ended up happening was they go to the Macon's Well Street house, because at this point, it was news, right? Like they found two infant bodies in the middle of Sydney. So it was news. The Macons had apparently dug up a grave that was in the front yard of their Wells Street house and placed that body somewhere else so that it would like not be it, it wouldn't be suspicious for them basically. But at this point police knew they had yeah, three and with the bodies. front yards. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just you know never funny? I would never bury one in my front yard. I looked at the house and it doesn't look like it would have well, if, if the, the house was probably demolished, right? So, like, I don't know what it looked like back then, but I mean, it's eighteen hundreds. Things were things are easy going back then. But it's not like they had like a big, beautiful front yard. I can't imagine. I don't know. Maybe it's weird to bury someone in your front yard, or just anywhere that's not a graveyard, probably, right? That's fair. <laughs> I mean, you. it's also weird to bury someone in your backyard, personally. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Police go back to the Macon home. They, they just, or sorry, the, the Macon home on Wall Street. They find this recently dug up grave. Like, oh, the body we found elsewhere, that had to be the body that was in this Wall Street house that was being moved over to this other location. When they found out 
that we found the two bodies of the Bur Burn Street house. So at this point, there's not really a ton of direct evidence that really a crime had been committed other than the unlawful disposal of a body, much less the makings were the culprit. All we knew is that some, for some reason, there's bodies that are showing up wherever these people live. And like, this is the 1800s. They don't know why people die or how they're, how they're being killed. They, they just know there's that's dead bodies. That's kind of true. Like, what do you, I feel like it's, I feel like it's a good question for later. Is like, when did you have to start telling people that someone died? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, I, when did when did you have to write that down? Like, probably like has to do with like taxes. So you probably would like tell, be like, tax me less because I have less people here. But like, I don't know when that like, became like, the law. I think the problem is that you're running an unlawful like graveyard or an unlawful cemetery, basically at this point. Right. We we don't know exactly what ailments these children end up having exactly. So. Like I said, like there's not a lot of evidence. There's just a lot. Of, there's a lot of like dead bodies, and for some reason, the makings are co costly around these dead bodies. So mm -hmm. they were questioned, and they basically denied having taken in any children during the time they were at that Burn Street house. But everybody was still kind of suspicious. Mm -hmm. And so two weeks after the initial three bodies were found, the police started digging up that Burn Street house again, and they find five more dead babies. Just a lot of dead babies. Oh my god! The look, it was, five too many. It was. I would argue it's eight too many because now we're at eight. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, eight too many. Uh huh. Totally agree. So it was basically at this point that the Makins were formally arrested. Sarah, John, and their daughter Blanche. They were taken into custody and questioned. Blanche was the first one to basically break and say, "Hey, yeah, our, my parents were baby farming," and she knew enough that like that wasn't a very well looked upon profession so that she she was gonna lie about it and then she realized like okay it's over i have to tell the truth yes my parents were taking in babies but at this point all they were saying they were doing was being midwives so they would say that for example that sarah was a wet nurse which is like i guess like it's a woman that can nurse when she's not pregnant is that right is that my, is that my yeah name? yeah technically yeah. like you could nurse forever like they have things now where you can nurse a baby if you have not even had the baby you just have to like adjust your hormones oh okay well yeah so i guess so that's what she was arguing is like, I'm a midwife, I'm a wet nurse. Like, we're not baby farm. We're not like those <laughs> creeps who baby farm. But Blanche gave it up. Blanche, the daughter, was like, yeah, we just taken these babies, basically. So in total, 15 babies were found buried at homes lived in by the Makins after it was kind of all oh said God. and done. I mentioned earlier that a lot of times the horrible shit that would happen to kids given up to baby farms were an outcome of the lump sum payment. But that's really... Sorry, it's based on the lump sum concept of like running out of money, but that doesn't actually seem to be the case here because in most of these cases, these kids were killed like a week or so after they were handed over to the Megan's. Like they weren't taking them in knowing for sure we're going to kill them. It wasn't like they ran out of money, then they killed them. They literally got them to kill them. Right. Because they were going to get paid this $4,500. Right. I mean, like, sum. why bother? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just kill if you're going to kill them anyway. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I wrote down, like, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it better necessarily that they didn't wait three or six years to kill the baby, but still, it does seem like more nefarious in some way. One of the kids that was found on the property was positively, positively identified as Horace Amber Murray, who had been born to an 18 year old named Amber Murray. Again, a lot of these kids weren't like, nobody give a fuck. <laughs> like, nobody give a shit. Like, their parents sold mm. them, and so nobody was really looking for them after the fact. But this 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 girl was. Right. So Amber had placed an advertisement asking for someone to adopt her baby for three pounds. The Makings replied saying if she was interested that she could bring the baby to their home, and that's what Amber ended up, ended up doing. One thing I noted here was, again, showing how nefarious their intent was, They the Makings would use face, fake identities to transact babies. They would use like they wouldn't usually sign their own name. They would present themselves as different people because and they would also move constantly. And the idea was that they knew they were going to kill the babies. They didn't want the parents to come back and say, hey, I want to see my kid again. If they did, they wouldn't find them because they had the wrong information or the wrong address or the wrong name. And so that's what ended up happening here. When when John signed the adoption papers, this is hilarious. He signed his actual name. Then he scribbled it out. <laughs> And then signed a fake name beneath it. <laughs> like he forgot. He oh forgot God. as he's purchasing a child. Who am I today in the scheme? So ridiculous. Hilarious. 
So, yeah, basically Amber takes her son, Horace, to this house, signs off on the adoption papers, and the kid is basically theirs. This is the one that was possibly identified oh, so in the sad. pile. Yeah, the reason it was identified was because um, Amber hand-knit a sweater or a, a shirt or something for the kid. Oh. And so dude, they, they literally took the kid and just killed it, like, immediately. And then, like, threw the body into, like, a drainage ditch. And so when they found the body, it was wrapped up in this thing that Amber knitted – they presented the knitted thing. It was like, yeah, that's Horace's. I made that for him when he was born. So, not great. That's terrible for everyone. Yeah. Especially Horace. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mentioned, you know, again, like, cases like this are, like, super hard to prove because, A, the technology isn't there to verify cause of death. All you have is, like, dead bodies. But, again, like, the suspicious part of it is that, like, most people like go their entire lives without having a single dead baby on their property. So to have like one family have 15 dead bodies, on, babies on their property, that's like a lot of dead babies. Like one or two you could probably get uh-huh. away with, right? I mean, if you get up to like, like I don't know where that dozen, baby came from. It was people who came here before me. It was a guy before me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. So actually, like before forensics and DNA and such or whatever, you'd be like, I don't know, you know, it's just like maybe it's a maybe it's an ancient baby, <laughs> you know, like who knows? Taylor, you as a reasonable, sensible human adult, how many dead babies would have to be like on someone's property before you're like, this is raising some red flags for me? Two. I'll give you okay. one. So you, so one you can get away with. The second one yeah, is when you're like. A- most people have zero. Now you have two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're crossing the divide of normal volume of dead babies on your property. Yeah, not I, I also want to ask some other questions. I wouldn't just be like, I believe you. I'd be like, you know, have you been in contact with a baby re- that's gone missing recently? <laughs> have you bought a baby for some reason recently? Has someone sold you a baby recently? Like, some general you have questions. a contract that it shows that you've been transacting infants. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do people call this the disappearing baby house? Like, I don't know. Are I want to see receipts. What could be happening? Any receipts? Yeah. Um, so they go to trial. The trial is literally just for Horace's death because that's the only one they could identify. And nobody else gave a fuck about these kids to look for them afterwards anyways. So the Makins were both sentenced to death, but there was a plea of clemency given to Sarah, which I don't really get because in my mind, the woman is the most appealing part of the deal. <laughs> like, like nobody's giving John a baby to take home with him right. on his own. It's like you right. need the woman to sell the man. Like, you know what I mean? I believe that. That I believe, yeah. But they're both sentenced to death. Sarah was asked for clemency. She got clemency on appeal. Uh, She ended up getting a life sentence instead of the death penalty. And John's execution sentence was reaffirmed on appeal. John was executed by hanging about five months after his conviction. They did it super quick. He made no statement. He basically, what they were saying was he looked like a man who was like resolved to his fate, fate basically. Uh, He did write two letters, one in which he proclaimed his innocence. He proclaimed that his wife did all this and he had nothing to do with it. I, hearing everything that everybody said about what a lazy, useless piece of shit he was, like, maybe that's true. I don't know. Maybe he didn't have, like, the gumption to do it? He, like, he made it sound that, like, I'm, like, my wife is overbearing, overpowers me, and I don't have the wherewithal to, like, stand up to her. Which is, like, yeah, that could be true. He did seem like a fucking dipshit <laughs> loser, you know? I'm sure having 10 kids wasn't his idea. I mean, it is, it isn't, it isn't. He, again, people need to know, understand how babies are made, and then perhaps... It's true. It's true. That was he was definitely of part of it. He wasn't not there, as far as yeah. I know. He was there. Yeah. Can you imagine what, what, what what's birth control look like in the 1880s in Sydney? Ugh. Like, Probably putting, not good. I, don't, I mean, I have honestly no idea, but no. I mean, we're, we're very lucky. We are very lucky. Uh, so <laughs> John John made no statement. He wrote two letters, one saying he was innocent. It was all his wife's doing. The other one was a loving letter that he wrote to his children. Sarah started her life sentence prison term, and her health, like, declined pretty quickly. It was implied that she had, like, that version of syphilis that Al Capone had that just, like, ate 
eat your brain alive, you know? Yeah. I think it's syphilis. Yeah, She's advanced stage syphilis. And so her yeah. her children like still seemingly loved her and they wrote to the judges and they asked for clemency, saying, Hey, it's her last moments on this earth, let her come home. And so eighteen years after she first went to prison for being involved in somehow having fifteen baby corpses on her property. We don't know how. She mm-hmm. was a suspicious number of baby corpses. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. An abnormal volume of baby corpses. She exactly. basically served 18 years in prison. She got released to her kids and she lived with her kids and she died about a year after she was released. And that was her wow. shitty, horrible, horrible life. If you look at pictures of these two, like she looks like a really, really severe woman. I don't know what it is about her. I would imagine being married to John well, probably wasn't a treat. Yeah, they both look kind of miserable. But I think that she, I mean, women I don't know, during that time looked terrible. Like I was looking at a picture of like Queen Victoria came up and Queen Victoria looked awful. Maybe it's like the harsh center part and all of the black, you know, they just like, no one looks great. Could be. Could they could be use bad. some like highlighter. Man, there's an economist. Watch your face. There's an economist who shares the name with John Macon. That's unfortunate. There's a lot of Sarah Macons on the internet that are not this one. I'm looking at pictures and it's like young women and then this one. God, that is a mustache on John though, isn't it? That is one is. prop duster. Those are that is a lot. That is a lot. But yeah. I, that's uh you know That's so like, sad. I really don't. I'm not going to say like I thought I would understand this. Like it would at least be something I understand. But like I really don't understand. Like I don't understand it from top to bottom. I don't understand paying someone to take your baby with what intentions. I don't understand. I don't understand so many things about this. Forty five hundred bucks. Like I understand. I I get that. But like, why would someone give you that much money to take their baby? Wait, forty five hundred like, bucks. It's, 4500 bucks. It's and they, the opposite right now. And they did it for 15 kids. So that's like nearly $70,000. I mean, that's a decent oh amount gosh. of money, but I don't know if I'd kill a baby over that. Like, I feel like I need a lot more money than $70,000 to kill a baby. Absolutely. I think we can definitely agree on that. Like, because like actually, that's how much it costs. 5000 <laughs> Overall, and he says in California, the average adoption costs between forty thousand and seventy thousand dollars for domestic infant adoption. What? So if you get an international one, they're more exotic, so they charge you more. I think they're cheaper. Oh, they are. Oh. I'm gonna oh see God, if I can get like a terrible. Swedish one. They can teach me. How yeah, to it's see cheaper one internationally. It's two, twenty thousand to forty-five thousand. Either way, no one's paying you to take their baby. I guess it's like foster care. They give you like money to like have the babies but like you don't get to keep them i don't i don't and the mom doesn't give you that like the parents of the baby aren't giving you that like the state is giving you that yeah it's anyway bad, i'm glad i don't understand this model. because it's a it's a bad thing to want to not, to understand if i was like no i totally get it then i'd have a problem with myself yeah so, yeah it's not a good model it's not a good it's model best. i mean just no. generally if no. anybody tries to sell a baby to you just tell them tell yourself no i just think that happens every once in a while like a parking lot you know, and then the, you call the police, and it turns out the mom was like on a lot of meth. You know, like that's bad. Did, but it, did it Charles? It's like give Manson... you money. It's not selling the baby. It's give you money. That's did, what... did it? Did it Charles Manson? The transaction. Tra- I'm pretty sure Charles Manson's mom traded him for a pitcher of beer when he was like two years old. I think so. I think something like that happened. Which kind of makes sense when you see how it all worked out. Um, yeah. I hadn't heard about that. That was terrible. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Those poor babies. Thanks, Dan. That was awful. I mean, in, in the end, if it's crazy wanted... that they that it's the exact same. Well, you can... wait. Go ahead. <laughs> no, if nobody wanted them, though, like, right? I mean, I guess they still yes, do no. want to be alive. Probably they probably choose that over being thrown into a sewage ditch. Yeah, I mean, once the yeah, like that's why we should you know help people who have babies. Right. <laughs> have to help them continue to take care of the babies because it's not right. the baby's fault, you know? Right. Like, I don't know. Um, boo. Yeah, not great. 
I wonder I wonder how many babies are buried on my property. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's one of those things that like it's just better not to know, you know? I have two and a half acres. It could be any number of babies. And I just have no idea. Yeah, your place is probably riddled with corpses. Probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, Juan Juan and Florence did a desert cleanup this week this weekend and they used a metal detector because people which we just learned they burn pallets at campsites instead of like firewood and it leaves behind like thousands of nails so they use a metal detector and they got like thousands of nails out of the desert ground which was cool and we were like we should get one and see what we can metal detect in our backyard because i've also been watching this thing that i think is not true it can't be true this instagram um of this like woman who goes to like little rivers around London and is always pulling things out of the river, like a beautiful old ink bottle, like a beautiful old pin, like a beautiful old something. And I'm like, how can you keep pulling cool stuff out of this river? Anyway, I want a metal detector. I'm going to look that up. I support you buying one. They won't help me find the dead babies, but like I do, I think I probably get cheap one. Metal detector. Man, can you, can you imagine if we started a Kickstarter for like a detector to find dead babies like how many questions would the fbi be asking us about that i don't even know unless the babies were like wearing metal i don't know how you'd find them i don't know you'd have to invent some new technology my, you um, a decent metal detector for like 79 dollars okay that's not bad that's worth it that's worth. that sounds like a fun activity with with the kids yeah it sounds super fun huh. so that is anyway, my very I don't fun know how we got there and hilarious and you know uh, hopefully everybody feels good after hearing that story feels relaxed feels happy it's pretty crazy it's the exact same time as krakatoa that's what i was gonna say like that is wild that's wild yeah look at you and me uh cool sweet well Well, is there anything that you want to read out Nope, I have nothing to read, but I do want to say find us on social media at Doom to Fail Pod. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, like and subscribe. Tell your friends. We have an email that goes out every Friday with what we have from the week. If you don't get like those push notifications, but you want to know what we're up to, um, it's on Substack. All of that's linked in our Instagram. If you just don't know where to go to find it, email us. Doom to Fail Pod at gmail.com. We need your support. I'll sign you up. Jerry signed up for our email. Thank you, Jerry, a friend of ours from. An old job. Oh, she Jerry. Sign up for hey, Jerry. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, yes. Please tell everybody you know we're trying to become famous and we will appreciate you if we become famous one day. Yeah. Thank you. High fives all around. We'll buy you a metal detector. There you go. Or a cool. baby detector. Um, sweet. <laughs> well, thanks, Taylor. Have a great cool. Sunday. Thanks, and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off.